Welcome to Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. I am your host, Lori McGraw. I have spent the past 30 years in leadership, and over the years, I've come to learn one thing. Women need women, and not just any women, but inspiring women. Tune in every week to hear from women at the pinnacle of their careers and from others who are just starting out. Episodes can be found at inspiringwomen.show or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will be inspired. This is Inspiring Women, and I am Lori McGraw, and we are kicking off 2023 with our first episode of Inspiring Women, and I am speaking with Dr. Carla Denise Edwards. Now, Dr. Edwards has her PhD in medical sociology, and she also has a number of degrees, whether it's in education or psychological services or on and on. Um, She has three decades of healthcare experience and pretty much started her career, as far as I can tell, as an executive. So we're going to talk about that. Um, She also happens to be an expert at the intersection of technology and healthcare. And Dr. Edwards, thank you for being on Inspiring Women. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, this is a new format for us. We're doing it with, you know, video. Usually these are audio only podcasts. We're trying something new because it's a new year. Again, I'm delighted to kick off the year um, with you. As we closed out 2022, we were talking to some guests about sort of like, what's the next big thing? And I think all of us have looked forward to a new and refreshing 2023. I don't know if we're in a new normal. I don't know what it is, but I think there's a better outlook perhaps out there. At least I'm feeling it. But why don't we start with where are you today and um, what does day to day look like for you, Dr. Edwards? Well, you know, I actually do believe that 2023 is the year we just need to claim joy. Um, Any of us who um, have had the benefit or the privilege of living through the last few years um, and coming out on this side. Um, need to claim joy. There's been a lot of loss, a lot of devastation. um, And so it's a new day. So I agree with you. There's something about this year that I think um, is going to inspire most of us to be our best selves. So I'm currently in Detroit, Michigan, um, at my home, uh, where I am serving um, on various boards, um, some for-profit, some community-based Um, And then doing volunteer work as I write, I'm writing uh, prolifically about various things, including healthcare. So that's where I am today. That's what I'm doing. As well as other things. Are you a Stacey Abrams sort of like closet (laughs) novelist or something that you want to unveil here? (laughs) Well, you know, I, um, I really don't intend for anybody to read anything that I'm writing. So I'm not writing with this hope of getting some big book deal, but um, I'm a surviving child. So my brother passed away in 2001 and I just feel obligated or obliged to make sure someone writes down his story so that he is remembered somewhere, somehow. And even if it's just my kids or my grandkids or my great grandkids who find pleasure in knowing they had an uncle, um, that's all that really matters to me. So it's writing a little bit about my brother's story. And then I don't know if you've heard, but I have this theory or manifesto about how to create a sustainable healthcare economy. And so for fun, I'm writing my own little manifesto, kind of like Jerry Maguire. I don't really intend to hit send. I hope I don't do it accidentally like he did. (laughs) (laughs) But I do have some thoughts about sustaining our healthcare economy that I thought would be fun to write down. Well, I want to talk more about that most certainly. I didn't know about your brother story, and um, I'm confident that will be interesting for others to hear. There are many surviving siblings and families and people who have lost too many, um, certainly because of the pandemic and other things, but um, hearing those stories and recognizing and remembering um, them, it will be impactful. And I'm sure it's also quite therapeutic um, to just go through that process. So congratulations on at least like even making the effort. Before we go into the manifesto, because I do want to talk about that, um, you've got three decades in healthcare. You were the you know executive officer of um, large health 
control systems, leading the strategy, working on whether it is combinations, multi-billion dollar institutions serving millions and millions of patients. You also were the founding CEO of a health exchange before that was even a thing and we didn't realize it was important. So I'd just like to start with, like, how did you get there? If I look through your bio and I've heard a number of your um, conversations and speeches and things, it seems like you started in the executive suite. That's what it seems like. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. I wish that were true. I actually, because, you know, so many young people think you can like graduate from college and then be the CEO of something, but it's actually because I switched industries. Mm -hmm. And so I actually started out my very, I guess, first professional job was as an assistant dean at the University of Pennsylvania. And actually, it is funny because I did kind of start off at a higher end of the spectrum. I had received my master's degree from University of Penn and my bachelor's degree, and I wanted to stay and get my PhD, and I was encouraged to leave. They said, you know, if you really, really want to make a dent, you need to have a different experience. And so I left, and I hated it. I wanted to go back to Philly, back to Penn so badly. One of the deans at the school said to me, you need to actually interview for a job and see what it what it's like. Like, what does it take to actually get a job? So she facilitated me getting an interview for a job I had no qualifications for. <laughs> well, lo and behold, I got the job. <laughs> uh, come on. Like, so... All right. So we know there's a confidence gap, you know, between men and women and men are sort of have the bravado, if you will, to do that. You did it. How'd you do I that? How'd it. you pull that off? I did it. You know what? I think it was because I was fearless. I didn't think I had anything to lose and I was willing, right, to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm an active and avid learner, but I'm also a very quick study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And most people have had the benefit or the privilege of working with me, <laughs> my ego, right? <laughs> uh, kind of pick up on that. So I don't actually know my superpower. Other people will tell me that's what it is. And so I am able to discern really quickly how to solve complex problems. Mm -hmm. It's a talent. It's a skill I didn't actually know I had until others told me I had it. But they picked up on that really quickly. So I became an assistant dean at the University of Pennsylvania with the criteria that I finished my PhD within three years. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. I was so busy partying and having fun because I'm back at the same school, right? That I went to school in the city that I matured in. And so I ended up leaving Penn as an assistant dean to finish my PhD at University of Florida. So to be real candid, Ended, I didn't start an executive suite. I left University of Florida at a very mature age and became an intern in the White House. So I was a presidential management intern with young people who were like 10 years my junior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I actually had to go backwards in order to go forward. Okay, I'm hearing that, but also thinking, but you're in the White House, and that sounds like a kind of forward place um, to be. So, were you yeah, comfortable in these big positions? Were you comfortable in these big positions? Were you comfortable in these big spaces? Um, and did, and so it's, you clearly have confidence. Did you always have that confidence, or was that just sort of bravado that you put put forward? Um, I think I did. And I'm going to say it because I'm the daughter of a U.S. Marine. And my father, who I didn't learn until after he passed away, Lori was what was called an integration officer. So we traveled throughout my childhood. Every two or three years we moved because he was stationed at a new place where he was the first or the only African-American officer in the US Marine Corps. And his job was to integrate, right? To be that first or only mm -hmm. right, during that time period. And one of the things he instilled in us was to be courageous and to be fearless and to own your space. He really did teach my brother and I at a very early age that because of civil rights, we had absolutely every right 
to be present. I find that amazing because clearly with three decades in these leadership spaces that you have occupied, that you have led, um, you were very likely one of one yes. only and breaking yes. new ground, a first of this, a first of that. Um, and that, you know, that that just is. And so be able to being able to carry forward that confidence. Um, I, I can't imagine the countless number of people that you inspired on, along the way that you don't probably even recognize, you know, that, that that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. But let's, let's dive into where that experience has led in terms of some of your thinking, because, you know, with this optimistic view, perhaps of 2023, I'd love to just maybe talk a little bit about your vision for healthcare. Um, you know, we've all been trying to solve this complex problem. We're now at over the $4 trillion of spend. We have a life expectancy that has decreased. We have chronic illness that doesn't contain, to turn around. I'm reading the news out of JP Morgan this week. I'm seeing things like, looks like there's going to be less investment in oncology, even though there's sort of like, doesn't seem to be the greatest breakthroughs that we need. But you have a vision. You have a vision that you believe that there is a way to fix healthcare that is sustainable, achieves outcomes, but also is financially viable. So just let's hear it. How can we do this? Well, you know, it's not to me that different from where we started. And um, I had the benefit, I'm going to digress just for a quick second. I had the benefit and the privilege of going to Spain over the holidays and we went to Barcelona and so part of the vacation was going to one of the first hospitals ever created back in the 1400s. And I'm walking, I made my family go on this tour of a hospital. Can you imagine? This is our vacation. <laughs> walking through the hospital and reading like the little placards about the history, the concept of creating a system of care that was built for people who had privilege and means, but obliged to serve the poor is not new, right? This dates back to the 1400s. Mm -hmm. And then merging and developing enterprises that could generate enough revenue to sustain that charitable mission has been happening for centuries, okay? So here we are, the year 2023. And what do we have? We have these systems of care that are funded and supported by those who have means and who have privilege. And then they're obliged to provide care to those who don't. One of the things that's fundamentally different today and in the United States from 1400 is that we in the United States live in a capitalist democracy. And so whatever we do has to fit within the fundamentals of capitalism where there's competition, free markets, and choice. And so I think what we keep forgetting every time we have the debate and we end up on these extremes between maintaining the status quo and creating a single payer system is that the status quo isn't working for us in terms of our desire to have market dominance in a global economy because we can't create the productivity that's necessary for us to compete in trade. So the current system's not working and having a single payer system's not gonna work because it's not consistent with our concepts and our commitment and our desire to have free will and competition. So we gotta find something that's consistent with that. And so with that said, I think we need to let hospitals be hospitals and compete on being the best that they can be. And then we need all of the other ancillary services to be the best that they can as well, right? And create a horizontal that enables us to ensure people get what they want, when they want, when they need it with some level of choice. And then we have to go back to 1400 to our core principles and values and make sure whatever we create and build does not leave out the poor and the vulnerable. There has to be a commitment to that and a commitment to public health that we have failed to recognize, I think until COVID. 
my hope is that COVID gave us a kick in the pants to invest in a public health infrastructure that protects the interest of the United States and its citizens, including our global economy, our participation in it that we didn't have before while we fix and perfect the system that already exists. Let me let me sort of like hone in a little bit on that point in terms of like the recognition um, and the moral imperative of recognizing those who don't have um, the privilege uh, to have means to get optimal health. And, you know, I just spent, um, it is the JP Morgan conference yeah. this week, but I have been attending all day um, the health tech for Medicaid innovation forum, um, which has been going on. It was a fantastic forum. And one of the things that was done in this, and I've been to this forum before, is they shared the patient stories and the patient journeys. And so one mother was telling her story, um, a black woman who lost her daughter, she calls herself a mourning mother. And, um, yeah. Very, very and, and Ashley, Ashley Johnson is who she was talking about her daughter. And it was, it was piercing to hear her. So, you know, I think with health equity, which we've all learned so much about in the pandemic, um, the actual stories of what it really means to not have access, to not have care, to be faced with um, bias, racism in the system and not be treated, it's, it's um, powerful and problematic. My question to you is, you know, are we really making the progress? Someone like myself, white privileged woman, you know, who has means and access. I don't have these acute stories around me um, every single day, but I've been through all the studies, forums, trainings, et cetera. Are we making progress? Should we be optimistic? We know we have a lot more um, to go. So just curious as to your thoughts there. Um, yes, we have absolutely made progress right? Like I'm one of the first people in my family to be born in a hospital. <laughs> now, progress, I think, is relative, however, because there's a presumption that being born in a hospital is better than being born at home, right? And so we have made progress because people have access to care, regardless of their income status. The quality of that care, is it equitable? I don't think so, not all the time and not in all parts of our country, right? But we have made progress. There's so much more work to do. And I think part of it is making sure we actually value health as a community, as in a society, and that we can actually see the return on the investment and the value proposition associated with every single person being healthy. How does that pay dividends for us collectively is the question we need to ask ourselves if we're actually going to turn this thing upside down. Well, one of the things that I think is so important about your vision um, for healthcare is your focus on the economics and your focus on recognizing that we are in a capitalistic um, society because it is my view it, that that money really matters. And even if you haven't, you know, been through all the work, the understanding of where you stand in this um, healthcare ecosystem, money matters and people do respond quite well um, to that. So um, whether it's in your book or whether it's by you just continuing to go out and share your knowledge and advise all the health systems and through your board work and everything else, I'm encouraged to hear that you're optimistic um, about it, but clearly knowing that it is, we have a long way to, to go still. Long way. Yeah. Let's keep working on it. All right, let's talk about you a little bit more, Carla Denise, after having done all of these things, reaching these executive levels, continuing to be a thought leader and really help shape the forward system of healthcare um, for you. You know, so you, you come with confidence, you come with um, experience and you come with having had many opportunities. Tell us about a time where you were knocked down. How did you recover? 
<laughs> and I'm laughing because you used the word bravado earlier. My one of the other things my father used to say is fake it till you make it. <laughs> so you make it. You know, I could talk about being knocked down yesterday or the day before or the day before that, because anybody who puts themselves out there is always at risk. And I put myself out there more times than I can count. And I'm always at risk. And so, you know, one of the things that I've learned is one of the riskiest jobs, I think, in healthcare is being the chief strategy officer. I've done it three times. And every time I've done it, I felt like I had some level of success in helping the organization move forward, helping the organization identify its goals and then achieve them. But guess what? When money gets tight, and things get rocky, strategy tends to be the first thing that gets moved to the side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, focus on the, you know, today. Operations, right? The efficiency, yeah. the what are we doing today, right? As opposed to what Carla Denise is interested in is positioning us for the future. Yep. And it's been difficult. It has been very, very difficult. Um, each time that, you know, I've gotten to that point where I had to think about, is this the right place for me, the right role for me at this time? I toyed with, God, did I make the right decision even doing this in the first place? And then I guess what? I do it again. <laughs> Three times, in fact. <laughs> do it again. And it's because I do have hope. I think I'm incurred, incredibly optimistic and hopeful. And I don't mind making dents and cracks that other people can then fill, right? So I've been knocked down more times than I can count, but guess what? I just keep getting back up. Well, that is, I think, the definition of an optimist in terms of, and also clearly your work speaks for itself in terms of its accomplishments. One more question before we close out. You, you describe yourself as a lifelong learner, um, and you've been in many different facets of healthcare and other things. What have you learned recently that surprised you? Um, I just finished reading this great book called The Power of Giving Away Power, given to me by my friend, uh, Daniela Levine. She's a mayor in Miami-Dade County. And one of the things I learned when I read that book was that all really valuable inventions or creations came when someone was willing to let their ego get put aside, let the competition move to the left or the right, and engage with someone or some other organization to create something new that didn't exist before. Knowing that whatever they were trying to hold on to was at risk of going away, right? And so one of the best examples was of uh, the company Visa, right? Think about Visa and MasterCard. There was a time when that didn't exist. The banks, not just the banks, but the department stores and the gas stations and the grocery stores all had to kind of put their stuff aside and say, that having a shell card and a JCPenney card isn't the future. Having a Visa card is. Yep. Right? And so there are various stories in the book about entities and organizations and individuals who ultimately said, in order for us to move everybody forward, we have to leave a little part of ourselves behind. You know, that's just such an interesting way to talk about it. I'm always talking to women about sort of like how to gain confidence and how to put yourself first. And you're actually suggesting, you know, put it aside for the greater, larger outcome. So I think that's really interesting. Carla Denise, as we close out on Inspiring Women, and I can't thank you enough for being on um, the first episode of 2023, what is your sort of best advice for women um, out there? Maybe a little nugget or, you know, a big nugget, but something that's just inspired you along the way that you might share with others. If it's possible to be brave, courageous, and humble at the same time, do it. <laughs> you have to be brave. You have to be courageous. And at the same time, be willing at times to be humble and kind of put your ego and your own things aside for the greater good. 
And I actually think that's one of the differences between women and men is that we always do that. We have to do that. It's part of our maternal instinct to do that. And sometimes you have to bring that maternal instinct to the boardroom. Well, you certainly are bringing a lot of it, both in the 30 years that you've put into this healthcare engine to begin with, and certainly a lot more to come. This has been a great Inspiring Women episode. I've been kicking off 2023 with Dr. Carla Denise Edwards. And Carla Denise, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been an episode of Inspiring Women with Lori McGraw. Please subscribe, rate, and review. We are produced by Kate Cruz at Executive Podcast Solutions. More episodes can be found on inspiringwomen.show. I am Lori McGraw, and thank you for listening.